All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step through each of the questions, and then what I want you guys to do is shout out what you think the, I'll read the question, shout out what you think the answer is. And you can also shout out ridiculous things too, because there were some ridiculous answers to the questions. <laughs> so question one, last week, two astronauts returned home to Earth after being unexpectedly marooned aboard the International Space Station. How many months were they in space? The correct answer is nine, 286 days. So they, they went up on one of the Boeing uh, spaceships nine months ago, and basically there were issues with that spacecraft such that they didn't want to bring them back down, and so they stayed on the ISS for a much longer period than they thought. And then just last week, uh, a, a SpaceX mission went up and was able to bring them back down. They landed in the Gulf of whatever you call it now uh, and, and, and landed there and, and were taken away safely. Question two, approximately how long will it take for the footprints left by the Apollo astronauts on the moon to erode by natural processes? This is a challenging question. I accepted a range of answers. What do you guys think? I accepted one to 10 million years. The answer is approximately three million years. And the way that you get this answer is, right, the, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere like we do, right? If you made footprints on some dirt road over there, they'd be gone pretty, you know, in a couple of days because we've got rain and, well, sometimes we have rain, but we have wind and, and all sorts of things that'll disturb that. But on the moon, there's no atmosphere to naturally erode structures. And so the only ways that they get eroded is through these different processes, mostly through micrometeorites coming in and impacting the surface and causing new craters. And it turns out this kind of gardening of the surface is a very, very slow process. And you, you essentially uh, move it one centimeter of material every three million years or so gets, gets recycled. And so, but this is really useful for looking on the surface of the moon and being able to date different features. Like w an area that has a lot of craters means that's an old area, whereas an area that has very few craters, it hasn't been around there long enough for craters to, uh, to, uh, to, no, but they erode through impacts. That's essentially how they eroded. So this was caused by like magma flows on the surface, and they've slowly eroded through impacts with, with micrometeorites and such. And this is, what's that? Yes, or larger impacts. It doesn't have to be micrometeorite impacts. That's, cr that's true. So you can have large impacts that fling material and cover up structures on the surface over time. So this shows a map of different craters, and you can see on different areas where there are a lot more craters, these are considered to be older features, older surfaces than some of the areas like the, the Maria, the, the dark regions here, where there are fewer features and they're thus newer. Does that? Yeah, the dog agrees. The dog's into it. Thanks, buddy. Yes, that is true. That if a, if a drunk teenager on a sustained colony goes and like, you know, kicks over the Apollo astronauts' footprints, that could happen in a short period of time. But I said by natural processes. So, well, exactly. A lunar rover could do the same, but that wouldn't be by natural processes of erosion. Question three: Scientists propose that advanced alien civilizations might build megastructures surrounding individual stars to capture all of their energy. What is the name for this type of structure? Dyson sphere is correct. This was this is the idea that you know much of much of the energy that we have, in fact, like 99.9% .9 of the energy we have here on the Earth comes originally from the sun in one form or another. And so if you really want to be efficient about collecting energy, you can build some sort of structure around that star, whether it's our sun or a different star, and collect that, that radiation. It was formulated by uh, Freeman Dyson, who recently passed away a few years ago, a prominent astrophysicist at Princeton. Um, and the idea is that you essentially build this shell of, of structure around the star. In this case, this is to scale for the solar system. It's a megastructure, so it takes a lot of work and money and energy to do this, but then you can harness all of that energy and use it for your, your own benefit. 
Um, and so this is like an artist's rendition of a mega swarm of, like a, a Dyson swarm of different objects that are all collecting the light from the host star. Question four. Last week, there was a lunar eclipse visible across the United States of America. What mission viewed it as a solar eclipse from the surface of the moon? Blue Ghost is the answer. So this is a mission sitting on the surface of the moon that was launched uh, in January. It landed on the moon a few, a few weeks ago and is still operational. And you know it, this was its orbit that got it there. It was the first private mission to land successfully on the surface of the moon. This is an image that I took from Death Valley last week when, this, when, this, uh, when the lunar eclipse was going on. Normally, people think of total lunar eclipses because of the red color. And that's, this is essentially the progression that you'll see a lunar eclipse. As the moon goes behind the shadow of the Earth, it's, it's blocking all the direct sunlight. So the only sunlight that's reaching the surface of the moon is light that's filtered through our atmosphere around the edge of us. And then it comes out. And so this is essentially kind of a diagram showing that, that process and why the moon, because it's in the direct, the direct shadow of the Earth, it only gets light that's refracted around the edges of the Earth, um, and, and which filters out the blue light so it appears red. But from the surface of the moon, this looks like a solar eclipse because the Earth is getting in the way. And for it should look, so, this is an artist's rendition. We've only previously had one image of this from the surface of the moon from Surveyor, one of the Surveyor missions in the 70s. But this, the, the, the photo quality was very poor. So this was actually pretty. I'm going to show a kind of a time lapse from the surface of the moon last week from the Blue Ghost mission looking at the sun as the sun gets darker and dimmer. And you can see like the diamond ring effect as it goes behind the Earth. It's pretty awesome, guys. This is pretty amazing. So this is an image of that. And you can't, it, the, the flux is so bright, you can't see uh, the sun so closely. But in reflection on this solar panel, you can see the diamond ring effect. And similarly, this is when you correct for the flux, you can see the diamond ring effect from, from the moon. So it's super cool. It's really cool. Um, OK, question five. What is the name of an orbit that's circling around the sunrise sunset line of the orbited object? Jamie revealed this. Uh, in his presentation, talking about the Spherex orbit. What do you guys think? It's the Terminator. The Terminator orbit, right? Yeah. Arnold's looking so young. Um, yeah, so as, as Jamie described, the Terminator is the technical term as the dividing line between the illuminated portion of an object and the shaded portion of an object. And so it's constantly changing. We had the Terminator right on top of us just a few hours ago at sunset. And so an orbit that goes along that line is called a Terminator orbit. Question six. Invented in the early 20th century, what device enables scientists to see the tracks of ionizing particles as they travel through this chamber? Cloud chamber is what I was looking for. This is kind of a weird image, but I'll show a better movie of it. The idea for this is you've got some sort of enclosed space. You can build one of these, and we built one, and I'll bring it to one of these events because it's super, super cool. You can build one with like an aquarium or some sort of glass box that's sealed off. You fill it with isopropanol, like rubbing alcohol, and saturate it with that, and then you cool off the base to a very low temperature with dry ice or liquid nitrogen or something like that. And essentially what happens is it... Uh, as the, the, the rubbing al alcohol fills that space, it becomes super saturated as it drops to this low temperature. And then any kind of disturbance in that, in that air will cause a, a contrail behind it, essentially. Kind of like when a plane flies overhead and it causes the, the condensation behind it. It's the same sort of thing in this. And it's really sensitive to particles that are traveling through space, that, that are traveling all around us right now. We just can't see them. Um, like. Uh, protons or electrons or muons or these sorts of things. And if you stick, for instance, if you stick like this is a piece of uranium that they stuck in one of these things and you see all of these, these trails going out from it, you're essentially seeing the condensation trails through this rubbing alcohol from the, the radioactive particles coming off a piece of uranium. It's super cool. But here's a nice video um, that was conducted at Harvard showing one of these. And what we're looking through is this cloud chamber. And all of the lines that you're going to see in this video are little contrails caused by 
muons and electrons and positrons and protons that are flying through space all around us invisibly. So you can see all these like, all the lines that you're seeing here, except the pluses, um, all these lines are, are vapor trails from invisible particles that are flying around us all over the place right now. That was a, that was a long, I think that was a muon, but it's super, super cool that you can, s this is real time. Yes, this, th that, the 20 seconds that that played, that is 20 seconds of real time. It's incredible. It's incredible. These things are flying around us all over the place. We just can't see or sense them. But this allows you to see the invisible. It's really cool. It's really cool. OK, question seven. And this was revealed as part of Jack's presentation. Which parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are best suited to observing the hot material, the one million degree material, in the filaments of the cosmic web? And I put up this little handy dandy EM spectrum just to help everybody out. What do you guys think? X it's x-rays and microwaves. As he revealed, the x-rays reveal the thermal part of the spectrum, but the microwaves are that Sanyev Zeldovich. Did you actually say Sanyev Zeldovich? Oh, OK. Uh, that's the part caused by the electrons uh, scattering the cosmic microwave background photons up to higher energies. And so you can see it in both. So I gave two points. Don't worry. Those of you who said x-ray, you still got a point. You just didn't get the full two points. And a nice image of the, the contours associated with one of these filaments between two clusters of galaxies. Question eight. Surprisingly, the most distant, i.e., the earliest formed galaxy ever detected already appears to have significant amounts of this element, which is essential for human survival. The answer is oxygen. So this is kind of a big deal. This was recently discovered. So this is the highest redshift, the most distant galaxy in the universe. It's at a redshift of like 14, which means that we're seeing light that was emitted from it about 300 million years after the Big Bang. And we think that galaxies can form on that time scale. But this has already built up a lot of oxygen, which is weird, because at the very beginning of the universe, there's only hydrogen and helium. Um, the first two elements on the periodic table, hydrogen and helium. And the only, the, the process of, there's various different processes that create heavier elements, but almost all of them occur in the interiors of stars. And so what this means is that it, even in the most like early snapshot we have of a galaxy in the universe, there's already a bunch of oxygen that's been built up there. So there's been a ton of formation of stars and the nuclear fusion that goes on in the interiors of stars to build up these heavier elements like oxygen. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. And this is a result that came out of the j people using the James Webb Space Telescope recently. Um, so it's pretty sweet. OK, question nine. What hypothetical device pro proposed by a theoretical physicist in the 1990s is the most realistic model of a warp drive enabling humans to potentially travel faster than the speed of light? Sorry, that was an awkwardly stated question. Wait, what was the? It is not a Cybertruck, sadly. That was not proposed in the 1990s. The Alcubierre drive was the answer that I was looking for. So this guy, uh, he's a Mexican physicist as a graduate student. Essentially, he was a big fan of Star Trek, and he worked out uh, a model for for a warp drive that was consistent with the warp drive that you have in science fiction. It looks something like this in, in terms of the space time. So essentially, the region in front of the warp drive is, can, is collapsing space time, and the region behind it is expanding space time. So you'd appear to just be standing still, but this is actually moving through space. And it's consistent with Einstein's uh, field equations. There are causality questions about this that may not make it realistic, but it, it is the most realistic version that we have of this sort of device that would allow you to travel. But one of the main things is that it requires some sort of material that's negative energy density, this negative mass. And you know, I'm made of mass, you're made of mass, this TV's made of mass. We don't know of anything in the universe that's made of negative mass yet. And that's required to enable this sort of, this sort of device to exist. So it may not exist, even if it abides by uh, Einstein's field equations, but it's our best best chance. And if you're interested, we had a recent public lecture given by one of the professors at Caltech uh, in January, and it's on our YouTube channel. So check out our YouTube channel, and you can hear 30 minutes more about this particular topic, which is quite interesting. OK, finally, question 10. The European Southern Observatory is currently building a new telescope called the ELT in Chile. What does ELT stand for? 
Extremely large telescope is correct. <laughs> Extremely large. Astronomers are very creative. Very creative. So this is a, an artist's rendition of it. It's meant to be 100 feet across. The mirror in the telescope is meant to be 100 feet across. And recall, if you will, the main purpose of an astronomical telescope is to see fainter objects. And the way that you do that is having an increased size in the primary mirror, primary mirror of your telescope so you can collect more light, so you can see fainter and fainter objects. So if you have a small pot, it's, it's kind of effective at collecting raindrops or photons. And the larger the pot, the bigger it is, and the more effective it is at collecting light and thus seeing fainter objects. And so the bigger you get, the better. So one of the largest telescopes, this is called the Very Large Telescope, the VLT in Chile. These telescopes are each about eight and a half meters in size, so like 25 feet or so in size. So they're big in diameter, uh, you know, probably from like me to the far wall or so. Uh, but, but now we're building telescopes that are a factor of three times larger than that in, in, in diameter. Um, so this is a movie that they put together. It's a real hype movie, but it's actually pretty cool, so I'll, I'll show it. This is being built by the European Southern Observatory, so essentially the Europeans uh, have an have a observing presence in South America, in Chile. Some pretty sweet lasers here. This is an artist's rendition, in case you're wondering. It's not going to allow you to travel flying through space, but it's pretty cool. It's like, it's a good hype video. I think this is the Kuiper Belt, maybe, here. No, you won't be able to see it. Extremely large. It's like Michael Bay, they got to do this thing, you know. The biggest eye. Oh, I like that astronomy on top. How big is it? Coming soon. So this is... You can go to their website, and you can see a webcam that gives you a live view, or at least from the day. This is taken today of that dome that's being constructed. They've made a huge amount of progress. They've got all these cranes working. Here's from the interior, and this is the framework for the dish that's 30 meters across, 100 feet across. And this is the infrastructure underneath that dome to build the frame for this enormous, heavy structure that's going to be moving around. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, but it's very exciting that they've made as much progress. They're, yeah, and a little portalette there for scale. That's, that's useful. It's like, guys, maybe you don't want to have the porta potty right next to the telescope. It could leak. But it does provide scale, which I appreciate. 